So how good do you think you can get if you take up swimming in your mid-30s to, you know, mid-40s? Is there a ceiling on that progress? Um, I think probably the data would say. My name is Josh Amberger. And swimming is so technical that you can't afford to develop any bad habits. By the time I was um, 11 or 12, I'm in the pool, yeah, literally 10, 11 times a week, um, 12 even oh, sometimes. Yeah, like, yeah, you know, swimming sort of 50 kilometers. Poor my child abuse. Sometimes I feel like I didn't have a choice. I didn't have a choice. Like, there's so much going on in the swimming stroke. It's not like turning a pedal on the bike or going for a run. There's... I'm guessing you train with amateurs from time to time as well. When you look at their swim strokes and their swim training, what are the biggest mistakes they're making? Um, yeah, it's a question on sort of everyone's lips. Josh, welcome to the Roadman Podcast. Thanks, Anthony. How's the off-season treating you? Um, yeah, mate, it's going pretty good. So I've taken a month off. Um, my last race was the end of October. I did Ironman Cascais, which is in Portugal. And it actually, the race went really bad. I didn't, I didn't finish. <laughs> um, it's probably the, the, the first race in my career where I've pulled out during the race, literally thinking, oh, I don't have it today. Um, so I think my body really was um, like out of gas at the end of the season. So I'd planned a little bit more racing after that, but decided to to call it there and, and take some time off. And I've um, been yeah, back home in Australia now and, and camping with my wife and um, yeah, enjoying a couple of weeks off catching up with family and friends. I've been away from home for six months now. So um, yeah, nice to be home and yeah, just, just starting to dabble um, in a little bit of exercise this week. So it's been good. Camping's a different experience in Australia, I'm guessing. Like camping in Ireland is you get absolutely soaked every single time you pitch the tent. <laughs> Australia just seems like such a cool place to go camping. Yeah, I mean, like our camping here is particularly in my area, um, off the coast of Brisbane. Um, on, on the east coast, we've got these massive sand islands. Um like ancient um, sand drifts and formations, but yeah, they're, they're really remote. So typically the, the island we go to is um, Morton Island um, or Fraser Island to the north. Fraser Island's World Heritage listed, so it's probably a bit more well-known around the world, but these places, are it's all sand. There's no sealed roads, so you need a full drive to get there. You need to go on a boat to get there um, with your car. Um, and once you're there, it's just like, it's like you just take a step back in time. Um, and yeah, you can't use your, your phone to call anyone. There's no reception. There's like no services here at all. So we're going for like a week without a shower because there's just no showers available. Um, <laughs> and we're pretty much fishing to, to catch our tea um, at nighttime. So it's, I mean, it's, it's an experience and it's actually, it's not an easy holiday. It's quite, quite a rough um, and very active holiday, but um, it's definitely what we love to do to, refresh ourselves in kind of like a sick way yeah but you know what we, <laughs> so, we talk all the time about like off season the importance of it for refreshing and getting ready for next season so much of that is mental like physically yeah sometimes we need a break but often it's just an escape from obligations drudgery you know plugging sponsors meetings the merry-go-round that we find ourselves in and even the social expectation to check social media, respond to WhatsApps, like it just gets like sometimes like someone's holding my head underwater. It's like, okay, I just need a break from this. Yeah, 100%. And like we've been doing this particular holiday, um, this remote holiday to Morton Island. I'll say remote, it's only like literally two hours from our house in Brisbane. And Brisbane's a city of two million people. But once you get there, it's you literally feel so far removed from everything. And it's that we've been going there for 13 years now and that this holiday has like taken new meaning for us over the years when we first started going there we didn't have iphones or anything like that and it was literally like it was kind of it was an, an adventure like we were discovering a new world um and that was the real thrill for us and that's what um kept us going back but now um me and my wife were a bit older um 
early to mid 30s and both having a professional career for quite some time. Ashley, my wife, she's number two in the world um, at the moment, Ash, um, Ashley Gentle. So oh, that's she's top class. Um, got, yeah, she's got quite a bit going on at the moment. But like now it's to go on this holiday, it's, it's like it's our unplugged holiday. It's a chance for us to set the, the auto email saying like we're literally not going, we're not going to get your message for the next 10 days. So, um, and don't expect a reply. And it's, it's amazing to, yeah, just put the phone down and not worry about it. And I always thought of myself as someone who wasn't sort of addicted to, to technology and, um, and the dopamine of, you know, of social media, but it's, it kind of inevitably happens when you part of your business as a, and, and profile as an athlete is to, put yourself on these platforms they do suck a lot of life out of you 100%. and um, it's just such yeah, such an amazing week to to forget about all of that and the thing we really like this year we actually called it our sleep camp because we actually got really good quality sleep like when the the sun goes down <clears throat> you know you you're not looking at screens or anything like that we literally um are in bed by 8 eight thirty, which is unheard of um, for me and my wife, and we, yeah, we sleep. We were sleeping ten hours a night some days, so it was amazing. But is bike packing, camp, and kind of generally being a well-rounded person, is that becoming a drawback in this new era of athletes like Gustav Eden, Christian Blumenfeld, who seem to be pushing that upward boundary of professionalism all the time? Yeah, like in performance terms, um, I know I'm not going to be. A world champion by spending my um, off season or pre season camping and you know going bike packing and these sort of things, but I think that's that's sort of like the line in the sand, perhaps between the old generation and the new generation. And I've had this conversation a lot with um, some of my friends in the world tour who are um, kind of around my age or late twenties, and they're talking about these young guys. Um, they just don't take any time off. Yeah. And that's part of the reason why they're getting so good. Of course, there's a, a lot of other um, facets of that. But, li- yeah, literally one of them is they don't have an off-season. Um, and that's in many ways like a conscious decision. They they see the level. Like I'm, I'm riding with a, a 21-year-old guy who's got a pro continental team. Actually, sorry, he's 19. He's got a pro conny team um, in Australia and he, he wants to go big and – he literally said to me, like, it's now or never. Um, and he's 19. And that's that's the attitude. And they don't take holidays. So. They don't take holidays. Um, but, also but also what they're doing as well is, like, so if you think of holidays as, like, the macro break over the season, but they're not taking those micro breaks where you go and you do a camp and then you come home from the camp and you go back to normal life and, you know, you can meet some friends and catch up with them, maybe have the odd beer. They're just spending time racing altitude camps, racing altitude camps undoubtedly the ceiling is going up and we're seeing better and better times across the board in Troy. But like, what's the long tail cost of that? Yeah, I think that's, that's definitely like the observation that um, all of us like older blokes are like waiting to see um, the longevity of these athletes. And um, yeah, it's a question on sort of everyone's lips. Um, for, for myself, like I'm not ashamed to, to take time off. Um, I think being 34 now, I'm sort of looking at, you know, the last sort of five you know years of my career, potentially, um, you know, a lot of people are racing till early forties successfully, but, um, I think that's, it's, it's, what's going to really pay for me in the back end of my career is being able to really differentiate when we're in season and when we're off season and, you know, off season means a whole bunch of things like, um, you know, family time. Um, literally stepping away from the sport and forgetting about everything, um, you know, putting on weight, things like this, that um, it's actually a really good feeling to to put on five kilos in a few weeks and then um, slowly chip away at that when you start to get back to fitness. Like it feels horrible, but, you know, I think in, in many ways that's that's actually healthy. And I've been fortunate to have very few injuries over my professional career. Um, and particularly no bone stress injuries, which are typically the ones that, um, you know, very sudden and, and forced and come about when you're, you know, in an unhealthy state. So, yeah, like I'm, I'm not ashamed to, to keep doing what I've been doing and, and my wife as well. Um, that's, that's part of our recipe for success and I think. And, yeah, it's just really going to be interesting to see 
um, yeah, what, what, how the young guys, you know, how they progress their career and, and the level that they keep going to. Um, because you touched on that point well, there maybe twice progress progress is so important to us as humans like you talked about putting on a little bit of weight and then chipping away to get that off because each week when you jump on the scales and you put your training peaks weight in there's progress and you can do that all through the off season when you come in a little bit fit as well you do your first bout of test and oh it's not very good you train for like a first block you come back to like you test again okay, I've made progress and progress makes us happy and progress keeps us going. But I, I really have that concern with those guys. Are they going to be able to stay motivated with the lack of progress? We're keeping that level so, so high like all year round. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think, you know, you can also look at other sports, you know, if we, um, swimming is obviously a component of triathlon. If you, if we look across to, to the development of athletes um, in a swimming context, you've got guys like Michael Phelps who are, you know, famously winning gold medals from 15 years of age. And by the time they're 25, they've won, uh, I don't know, whatever it is, 16 of them or more. Um, and, you know, famously in Beijing, he won, I think it was eight in one Olympic Games when he was 21 or something. It's just insane um, the progression these athletes make. And swimming's a sport where it's, it's literally total dedication. It's eat, eat, sleep, train, repeat, you know. Um, and a lot of these athletes, they're done by the time they're early 20s, particularly the sprinters. It's a really short window um, that they're at the top of the sport. And a lot of them, particularly in Australia, you know, they unfortunately they sort of cycle after their professional careers. They, you know, they explore things like partying and having fun. Well, you look at Michael Phelps um, and, and, and he's to somewhat debauchery and yeah, like um, a lot of them, like Phelps, he's done, but he's also done in the sense that he's come out of that whole period of his life with some pretty legit mental health problems as well. Like he's not a happy dude from all accounts. Yeah. Um, I haven't, I can't speak much for Phelps. I just know like a lot of the, the guys we've had here in Australia, Grant Hackett, um, Ian Thorpe, they, they might ring some bells as being some of the greatest swimmers of all time, but they've all really had their struggles um, after the pool. And a lot of the females are in that category too, but they don't sort of end up in the media the way that Grant Hackett on a bender might. Um, but definitely swimming being such a consuming sport, yeah, we have seen a lot of um, elite athletes finish their careers and and yeah, the health implications from that. So like, I don't, I, I hope that this happens to no one in, in, um, in, in our sports, you know, cycling and triathlon. But, um, unfortunately there's always the real chance if, if the, if the attitude is to, towards your sport is all consuming and, and all in. So you're one of the best swimmers in the game. What do you put that edge down to? Where did that edge come from? Um, it's pretty simple for me. I was, in, I was swimming by the time I was, um, or in the pool, in the water by the time I was eight months old. Um, in Australia, they kind of just grab babies and literally chuck them in the water and you, you work it out. So for me, swimming, I mean, for swimming is like another language. Um, being in the water, feeling the water, knowing how to move through it. It's, yeah, it's literally like trying, trying to learn another language and, this is the difference between trying to teach a, a, a child to swim and an adult to swim. The, the kids somehow just get it. Like if you go to to watch any sort of young squad of, of kids at, at, at your local pool, you'll just see that that they like know how to move through the water. Um, they might not be going that fast at, at such a young age, like six or seven or eight, but if you watch an adult in the water, um, generally like they're fighting it. Like they kind of have an adult new to swimming that had kind of no idea. Um, and that's for me, like I, it's yeah, just so easy because I learned from such a young age and that's just culture here in Australia. So how good do you think you can get if you take up swimming in your mid thirties to, you know, mid forties, is there a ceiling on that progress? Um, I think probably the data would say yes. Um, <laughs> there's, I think developing like swimming muscles is quite specific and developing 
the position your body needs to be in the water to swim effectively is quite difficult. That being like flat, a lot of people um, jump in the water and they literally like their, their, you know, their, their toenails are like scraping against the bottom of the pool. So trying to teach someone how to actually like float properly in the water um, to be able to swim well is is quite a unique skill. I think the the biggest limiting factor for for teaching adults to swim, and I'm not a coach by any means, so this is just all like opinion or anecdotal. But we just want to think about too much. Like there's so much going on in the swimming stroke. It's not like turning a pedal on the bike or going for a run. There's literally so many um, like hand entry and um you know breathing and there's a lot of timing aspects to swimming that that is difficult um and so teaching an adult to just think about one thing and one thing only is very difficult they want to like throw four or five things in at one time and try and do too much so um overthinking i think is yeah the biggest limiting factor um to teaching an adult to swim there's a really interesting book called thinking fast and slow and the central idea of it is we have two decision-making pathways, type one decisions and type two decisions. I'm not sure if you drive like a, a manual standard car, but if you do, yeah. when you... i got a Land Rover behind. Nice, me. nice. Yeah. So when, when you got started <laughs> on that, you remember that process of you're putting clutch down, you're like, you move to the left and up to find first gear, checking your mirrors. Like there's a lot of stuff going on and you're trying to process this. So that's a type one decision where it's very conscious and it has to be very deliberate. When we spend enough time on an activity, the author suggests that we move something to unconscious, to type two decision making. So that's you driving the Land Rover right now. You know, you could be drinking, not that you would, but you could be drinking, you know, soda, coffee, can of beer, going down the motorway, chatting to your girlfriend, <laughs> radio's on, on the phone, smoking a cigar. You could do a hundred things at once. You don't have to think about that gear change anymore. That's just automatic. We've built that machinery and that chemistry. And I wonder, is that the exact same with swimming, where we build that machinery by just errors, reps, and it then becomes unconscious? You're becoming a fish. 100%. Like, I think that's totally, you could apply that to swimming for sure. Like my wife, um, Ashley, she's, she only started swimming when she was 14. Um, and in triathlon, swimming is generally her weakest leg. Only 14, um, like, and, still so young. <laughs> yeah, only <laughs> So, like... <laughs> Right now, we've we've just swum in the pool twice this past week, and um, we've progressed pretty quickly. We did three k the first session, four k the second session, um, and you know our sessions in season are only get, getting like to sort of five k in volume. So already, um, you know, after taking more than a month out of the pool, I can jump in and swim for an hour, um, quite easy. But Ash, on the other hand, she's her feedback is, oh, Josh. But, you know, do your arms hurt here? You know, is, is your back <laughs> sore here? Um, so like her, her body just has less memory for swimming than mine. I can kind of jump in the water. Um, yeah. Anytime and not think about it. Whereas right now I'm really conscious about making sure Ashley um, is swimming with good technique. If she jumps in now um, and is reporting all this muscle soreness everywhere, it's a really, um, like a, a time where she could develop bad habits heading into the season and swimming is so technical that you can't afford to develop any bad habits. Um, so yeah, it is really interesting. Um, uh, whereas, you know, I'm not changing my, my stroke at all. It's, it's set. Like I just have to make sure I've got a little bit of mobility through triceps, lats, um, pecs to make sure I'm not sort of chopping my stroke. Um, but yeah, Ash is really, really struggling with, uh, yeah, the, just the muscle groups and, and that motor pattern that, that you need for swimming. Do you ever have swimmers who change their stroke? Like I'm thinking of Tiger Woods when he was the number one golfer in the world and his ambition wasn't to be the number one golfer in the world. His ambition was to be the greatest golfer of all time. So he's seen limitations in his current swing and he said, this swing I have is good enough to keep me at number one in the world, but not to make me the greatest golfer of all time. So we went away, took some short-term pain, didn't win some tournaments. People said it was a mistake. But he came back and solidified that reputation as the greatest golfer ever with a new swing. Do you see athletes doing this in swimming? You do to some point. I mean, there's this um, idiom, different strokes for different folks. Like some people just don't get the conventional way of swimming. Um, and that could be 
restrictions from mobility. They might have never stretched until their you know early thirties or something. Um, and you know, we see a lot of a lot of professional female triathletes specifically um, come into Ironman racing in their early thirties, and they're professional by thirty two or thirty three, and that um, they don't know how to swim and and pro- properly, so to speak. So, like I've had training partners before where the coaches taught them to swim with straight arms for instance, and it looks like horrible. Um, It's like a windmill going through the pool, but for whatever reason, for this particular athlete, that's something that they've been able to understand um, and obviously see benefits from. So it's definitely not at the level of like Tiger Woods, like trying to invent the the stroke, the swimming stroke that's going to get you the greatest of all time. But it's it's enough for a swimmer to get by just yeah, just like trying to find little hacks of you know, do, do you swim straight arm or slightly bent elbow, or do you swim with a a shorter a shorter stroke at the front, a bit longer at the back? Um, yeah, just trying to find the right mix for for a particular swimmer is something we see every now and then. Triathlon is quite interesting because even the biggest races in the world, you're thrown in with a lot of amateurs into the race. And I'm guessing you train with amateurs from time to time as well. When you look at their swim strokes and their swim training, what are the biggest mistakes they're making? Are you talking at an amateur level? Yeah. Like the, the age groupers who are um, ambitious, time crunched, and they're just like almost standing in their own way with these mistakes. Yeah, so I the the pool we swim at here in brisbane the fernie hills pool there's no real squads so there's just a lot of like lone wolves that rock up um and swim by themselves and what i've seen a lot at the pool is um athletes turning up and they're just so um set on hitting hitting the targets like hitting the volume um you know doing 90 a 90 minute swim but that 90 minutes of swimming they've done technically um, and physiologically is like really poor. Um, so that almost becomes a waste of time. You know, they're just basically swimming for swimming sake. And, and in some ways that's a lot of, you know, a lot, that's part of endurance is doing the volume of endurance sports is doing the volume. But if you're doing it really poor and not thinking about what you're doing, then, you know, you have to, basically go go back and ask yourself the question like is this helping me get better and most often like throughout the year ash and i we, we're at the pool and we're seeing these athletes kind of get slower like we're looking at um someone and if, if there's anyone listening to this thinking that that's them like i'm sorry about that but like we're looking at these athletes going like oh yeah like that almost looks like a new low for this particular <laughs> swimmer um so you know, you can you can make really quick gains with your swimming um, if you just are very focused on um, trying to improve technically through the water. And I've mentioned mobility as well. Like for me, my, if I don't have the mobility through my lats and triceps and rotators, um, I'm not swimming at my potential. So, for, like, just finding a, a coach that can help you with that is super beneficial. Um, and it's not always something we want to go out of our way to do but someone who can teach you to swim properly is going to help you um, in the long run it's super interesting that you've mentioned ash quite a few times i spoke with the coach for gustav eden and uh, bloomfeld alexander boo and the main thing he credits the success of that norwegian movement to the kind of athletes that are coming out of bergen it's the culture that when and I've been in squads like this in cycling where someone finds a gain, whether it's an aero gain or a nutritional gain, but there's such a culture in the squad that it's it's zero sum for me to win, you have to lose, that there's only a limited number. Of, there's four of us are only going to this uh, World Cup and there's nine on the squad, so you're competing against your teammates. So it doesn't have this open culture of transparency, of sharing information. But the two guys, even though they're each other's biggest rivals, when one of them finds an edge, he's fostered a culture where they don't keep that edge hidden. They share that edge because the problem he said, when they keep the edge hidden, they rely on the edge and they're not going to win races. They're going to be the greatest ever in his words. So when they share the edge, it forces them to 
up every other area of their game. And I'm, I'm thinking this as you're talking about Ash, because it's such a perfect synergy for you because you can share breakthroughs because you've nothing but her best interests in mind and the exact same for her. Is that How important is that to your you know, the continuing development and evolution as an athlete. Yeah, I hundred percent think that you know Olav is right, and they're onto something there. Um, I, I guess tongue in cheek, the the most interesting thing to say here is I am Ashley's husband. So typically, she doesn't want to listen to me like most <laughs> of the time. So it's really really hard to impart impart advice on her without there being like the husband lens and and she's like don't tell me what to do sort of thing um which like in all seriousness i could um like i'm doing some error testing and i've found calf sleeves are you know five or six watts faster and she's like doesn't like calf sleeves you know she hates the look of them or whatever and she's like nah not wearing them despite (laughs) the uh and then and then next time she's at the error testing and and you know she's got she tests the calf sleeves and she's like okay yeah yeah all right I guess I'm wearing calf sleeves from now on so like I can I can say something but um, it might not necessarily uh, be on the uptake uh, for Ashley but generally like we do have a very complementary style to what we do um, particularly with you know the facets like nutrition um, and recovery and things like this and. It's really funny. I mentioned to you before the show, I've been a bit stressed this week, uh, missing some sleep. And it's actually quite a shame off the back of my amazing um, sleep camp that I mentioned earlier. But um, yeah, she's she's giving me like these, you know, she's telling me what I need to do. Like, look, you're on your phone at, you know, eight, nine, nine o'clock, you're sending emails. Like, what, like, what are you doing? Of course, you're going to sleep like shit and wake up thinking about stuff. Um, and I, I, on this, on the same hand, like I'm also not that proactive in taking up that advice and I'm I'm living with, um, with one of the best and I'm not listening to her in a sense. So it's always, yeah, it's definitely a good point. And it's always a reminder to, to, um, yeah, sort of put your relationship to the side and just look at, look at the facts black and white and, um, take her advice and, and yeah. It's, I don't know, maybe you could call it like the, the socialist. We, we should come up with some sort of a coin, coin a term, but it's, it sounds very socialist to me to be sharing all this uh, performance information. Well, for the record, I identify a lot more with your setup than I do with that Alexander Boo one because my girlfriend's got into cycling in the last year. And like I'll say to her, you know, your long rides, you're doing them too hard. And she's like, what, shut up. What are you talking about? Like, they're fine. They're fine. <laughs> and then someone else who's like, you know, a cat four or something. She'd go out on a ride with them. She'd come home. I was like, oh, he said I'm doing my long rides too hard. I was like, I'm going to start doing them a lot easier. I'm like, all right, just don't talk to me anymore. <laughs> just let, yeah, I cannot exactly. talk to you about cycling. Exactly. <laughs> but, uh, how do you keep your training fresh? Because when I think about someone that's been in the sport, you know, we reference those kids that maybe they have these long careers, but we won't know. We'll have to put a pin in that one and revisit it in 10, 15 years. But we know you've been around the sport for a long time. You're 15 years at the top of the game, seeing some crazy evolutions. How do you keep the training fresh each year? I mean, I think that's first and foremost, the benefit of triathlon. So I started competitive swimming and you know by the time I was 13 or 14 I was like totally burnt out from that I needed a change I was probably at a, a at a crossroads where I could have gone professional in swimming if I wanted to pursue it um, but it just wasn't any interest in me because there was no variety to it I, I just needed more stimulus you know by the time I was um, 11 or 12 I'm in the pool yeah literally T- 10 11 times a week oh, that's um brutal. 12 even sometimes yeah like yeah you know swimming it's borderline child sort of abuse 50 kilometers <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean it's, sometimes i feel like i didn't have a choice in it and it was sort of mum that was <laughs> making me go training every morning but do you resent that maybe in some ways that was on um, i mean i think me choosing to do triathlon in some way was pushing back on that and um just really 
exploring the variety that of, of training that triathlon has to offer. So like when I worked out, you could go um, running on trails through the forest and how that made me feel. And, um, and you can go ride your bike up, up, you know, mountains and um, on the mountain bike, like through the bush. It was just like such a liberating feeling to, to go, whoa, this is like so much better than swimming. Um, it was incredible. And that's, that's still the diversity that keeps me invested in triathlon as a professional sport, the, the variety that we're doing. Like this, this next few months, months uh, n- this next month before, say, New Year's, we're going to be riding um, off-road um, on the gravel much more than we'll be on the road. Um, and same with running. We'll be running, you know, hilly trails. And, um, you know, by the time we're looking closer to racing, that's obviously totally changed. We're not really on a gravel bike. You know, we'll be doing stuff much more specific. But the variety is just something that's incredibly liberating and inspiring as well. And then, you know, we've got our preferred training locations around around the world. So, we, when we're in Europe, we're training in Andorra and we're getting totally different stimulus in Andorra than what we are here in Brisbane. Likewise, when we're in the US, we're typically in Boulder and it's like different again. Um, and yeah, just that, that variety is definitely what keeps me going. Like with 15 years in the game, you've experienced a lot of changes. And I often think changes fall into kind of two categories. We have those creeping changes, like you referenced. You go to the wind tunnel and you find three watts with a new sort of fabric on your calves. They're slow changes and they kind of creep. But then others come along every now and then, which are just a dramatic fork in the road. We're like, whoa, this is like a total shift in what I've previously been doing. Have you had many of those fork in the road moments? Um put me on the spot here but probably like generally aerodynamics on the bike in general is something like if you if you look at photos of triathlon um particularly like Ironman from sort of 15 or 20 years ago like they're doing nothing aero. Yeah. like it like you know they're you know their arms are flat their heads like scooped up you know even if you look at world tour time trials like the positions are just Horrendous. Yeah. You look at the um, in Yano some ways, ones from back uh, in the day and they're like, I can already yeah. tell that's not aero. Yeah, like and you've described aero as a creeping change, but it's also if you know, in the context of like our sports age as a whole, it's happened very rapidly. Um, you know, the positions that athletes are adopting and the equipment needed, you know, like custom extensions to to get into these positions. It's it's wild. And within the space of like two years, you've gone from, you know, like around stock round extension extension to literally everyone just having these big, huge fairings off the front of their bike with integrated everything. So like, I'd probably say that that's a rapid change. And we're definitely seeing that in, in the bike times, you know, there's athletes consistently riding, um, four hours or, or below even, um, for, for 180 K, um, Ironman. So, so that's 45 K an hour, um, average is, you know, roughly that, that sort of four low four hour mark. So it's just like, and you know, that, that used to be the pace that we were riding at in half Ironmans, you know, only five or six years ago. Um, it's just, it's a rapid change. Um, but also, you know, nutrition is also, one of those things where overnight, like you, you know, when I, when I first started doing long course triathlon, I had no idea about nutrition. I was having like three gels an hour. That was just basically the rule. If you do an Ironman hit three gels an hour. And that's like, if I look at the products I was using, that's the equivalent of like 70 grams of carbs an hour. Now we're punching like 120 average. But you know, even triathlon was quite progressive with And that. the same for training. Like, because I wasn't taking near that. Like as a full-time bike rider, especially in France, I remember you'd be in the break in a race and you go back to the car and you'd be like, I need another gel. I'd be like, no, you had your gel for today. It's like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> you, it was wild. And world tour riders were doing six hour rides with training rides, no food. Like eating is cheating yeah. was a phrase I heard so many times. If you pulled out a gel on a training ride, you were a laughing stock. <laughs> like people were falling off their bikes laughing. Yeah. 
yeah, you'd get shamed into doing that. And I think that's obviously, we, you know, we've spoken about the younger generation earlier, but they already have this information at such a young age. So that's part of how they're so good so young is they, you know, there's no shame um, in, in eating it. And that's already been sort of, you know, demystified for them. They don't have to worry about that. They're, they're on high-carb protocols from the time that their talent spotted, whereas, yeah, we were – hunger flatting and um, doing god awful things for our recovery because it was that was just the culture yeah it was um, like a long game of trial and error wasn't it because even things like i'm thinking my time in france where and i still do this i don't know why it's like oh, we talked about automatic program and maybe it's in my automatic program and i'll go out with my girlfriend to a restaurant and i'm digging the center out of the bread roll She's like, what the hell are you digging the center out of bread roll for? I'm like, I don't even know. Just people told me how to do it in France. They said you get bread legs if you eat Reducing it. Reducing your carb count, yeah. <laughs> what are bread legs? That's not a um, uh, physiological I, term. <laughs> I always remember re- um, there's a famous little cycling book. It's called um, The Racer or something. It's written by a Dutch guy. And he's talking about... Um, um, or the the race. Do you know the book I'm I don't talking know, no, about? I read it. Uh, it's it's fascinating. Maybe I'll link it to you after the after the um, show. But he's uh, if you if you break it down over the course of this amateur road race that he's telling the tale about, he had like five figs, and that was his <laughs> fuel for the whole you know 260k race. Is five dried figs or something? It was just like. Um, I definitely get the sense that, yeah, like you said, perhaps triathlon was ahead of the curve um, before cycling, but um, it's really interesting now. Like Cam Worth is a good friend of mine. He rides, you know, half a year for Ineos and then they cut him loose and he, he can pursue triathlon for a bit. But he always says um, when he's going from the road race season um, back into triathlon, he's saying that um, – part of his transition back to triathlon and getting ready to race triathlon is um, actually reducing his his carb count um, because triathlon such a like a fat burning sort of more of a fat burning race for interesting um, he's, he's saying in the road races you're literally going back to the car and eating the whole time and you become so dependent on carbs as a fuel source in, in triathlon like if you're on the bike um, you have to have all your nutrition with you um, for the Ironman. Like before you start, you can't really rely on grabbing nutrition at aid stations because you know you, you, it's slow. Um, you're not guaranteed to actually get what you want. Like aid stations are absolutely chaotic. Um, we don't have a, a musette where there's we know there's ten guaranteed things that are going to be in that bag. It's literally whatever you can grab at 45k an hour, um, sometimes faster. Um, so you need to start your ride with, you know, your 400 grams of carbs or whatever, um, which is extremely difficult on, to fit on the bike and it's also super heavy. So you can't rely on – He can, Cam's saying he can't rely on the same fueling protocols in triathlon that he can in pro bike racing because in pro bike racing it's easy. There's a car there, there's a team. Well, that's that's um, super interesting. So it, is, like, it is. So for you, like we're, we kind of pushed the, by the modern nutrition companies the agenda of, okay, you need 120. Some people are pushing that sailing up to 140 and playing around with 160 grams of carbs per hour. But for – the Ironman bike leg, the Ironman run, they're sub-threshold efforts. They're like zone three sweet spot efforts, which aren't entirely glycolytic. There's a combination of fat and glycogen fueling for that type of effort. So do you adjust your carbohydrate intake based on that? Um, a, a little bit. I think the biggest thing about triathlon is your carbohydrate intake is just inconsistent throughout the race. Um, because you start the swim um, and you can't eat or drink for an hour, the first hour of the race. So by the time you start the bike, you're kind of in deficit and you need to front load. Um, And then when you're running, you, you're not, you know, you can't run with water bottles or you I mean, you can, but it's heavy and it's uncomfortable. Personally, I don't like to run with anything in my hands. If I've got a lot of fuel in my pockets in the back, it's bouncing and it annoys the shit out of me. So I'm relying a lot on what I can grab at the aid stations. Um, so it's just you have to um, – and, of course, yeah, when I'm on the bike, I can run a super high-carb um, mix if I've got that 
prepared on my bike. So it's just the, the, the fuel loads are very inconsistent throughout the race. And it's, um, you know, you can't really look, be looking at your watch when you're running and be worried about, um, you know, sucking all the, all the nutrition when you're supposed to, because sometimes it's just not available. Today's show sponsor is Pillar. Well, we're all familiar with the importance of electrolytes and carbohydrates and their role in our race preparation. Pillar is taking a completely different route. It focuses on micronutrition, ensuring we're ready to perform even before we hit the start line. It's all about promoting a good night's sleep, facilitating effective recovery and replenishing those crucial micronutrients so you can perform at your very, very best. I've been running my own personal little experiment over the past month and I've been incorporating Pillar's triple magnesium supplement into my evening routine. I take it about 30 minutes before bed and the results I've seen are absolutely remarkable. The improvement in sleep quality, about 10% I've seen. I've been tracking my sleep with my Whoop device and the results are there in absolute black and white. I've given this to friends, they've tested it and they've all experienced the same results. I wake up feeling refreshed, having had a deep restorative sleep, so I'm ready to attack work, training and life the next day. But don't just take my word for it, the data from your fitness tracker will tell you the story. So if you're ready to elevate your performance and your sleep quality like me, just go ahead and give Pillar a try. Head to pillarperformance.shop and use the code ROADMAN on your local website for 15% off your first order. If you're watching this in the US, head over to thefeed.com forward slash pillar and use the code ROADMAN for 15% off that first order as well. Now let's get back to the show. So equipment has changed so much in the last few years and even you know we're, we've changed to wider tires chains have gone wax jockey wheels are all oversized ceramic bearings but there is some cool new tech that does kind of excite me as to what's possible like you mentioned aero to, aero testing in the wind tunnel for a long time that huge barrier to entry for our age group athletes on that is just cash like you don't have a sponsor paying for this wind tunnel time it's very expensive to find these gains but we are seeing like real-time aero testing devices now. Have you played around with that or any of the other wearable tech like continuous glucose monitors, continuous lactate monitors, or any of this kind of, I call it next-gen tech? Yeah, I've done like a little bit. I haven't done a lot. I've um, I've got an aero sensor and it's actually just really hard to work and to understand. I used it recently on the track um, on the Velodrome, I was testing with Jordan Kirby, who's a um, IP world champion. Um, I think it was 2017. Um, so he, he knows he knows a lot about what he's doing um, um, on the track. But I actually finally felt years after purchase, I had yeah some I got some value from this device. Um, I'd never successfully been able to use it on the road. There's just too many variables. Um, for it to be reliable on the road, for the data to be reliable. Um, I think, yeah, indoors is where that's really singing. Um, but in terms of other sort of wearable tech, I've been playing around recently with um, a Nix hydration sensor. It's um, actually, so like I've always had problems with um, you know, cramping uh, in a race, particularly like the run, but typically it's from overloading sodium and not like underloading sodium, which might be sort of common wisdom. So for me, it's been really interesting to sort of wear this device and set parameters um, on how much I'm sweating and the composition of that sweat in terms of sodium. So obviously like how does it work? Is it like a patch or what is it? Yeah, it's a, it's a patch and it's like fully sealed and it's just collecting your sweat and, um, you know, determining the composition of it. But I've really found some interesting data between like the environments where I'm sweating. Like if if you have been doing a, if you've done a sweat test um, in recent years, it's pretty much just been you're sitting static in a room. Yeah, I've done one in a lab, and it just feels so period. pointless. It's like like I'm sweaty because I'm in a lab. Like this is a totally different environment yeah. to a race in. Yeah, exactly. So I've just I've I've been wearing it for different bike. Um, sessions like indoor, outdoor, um, run as well, treadmill, outdoor, um, hot, cold. And it's just been really valuable to see 
the data from those different environments. And then I'm obviously testing before a race, trying to get similar conditions to understand what I need to replace or better understand what I need to replace during the race because, yeah, I've had some times where I'm sticking to my normal um, protocols and I'm cramping or, you know, I have upset stomach or something and generally it's, I haven't changed anything from my last race but the conditions are different so I'm just adapting, learning what to adapt for for the new conditions. So I think that, yeah, like this wearable tech is opening like a lot of doors and just helping us understand um, how to to better optimize what we're already doing that's for awesome different environments i definitely want to check that out so i'm going to look it up after this uh, conversation just finishing up like you might have all gone well burn injury sickness five six years left at the top of the sport have you taken time in the off season to reflect or maybe i'm putting you on the spot right now as to what sort of legacy you hope to leave behind in the world of triathlon um yeah go, going deep here i think for me i've you know like i'm not hitting the very top of the sport i've my best result at a world champs is second in the i2 long distance world champs which is sort of considered like a b-level world championship in a sense that ironman is always sort of the you know the the, the top rate um world championship race and long distance but um, I've had some top tens at Worlds, but c- certainly like nothing where e- anyone's really going to remember me for my results or being the best. Of course, I'll I'll remember my results in the best races, but I think what I really like to do um, in you know how how I go about um, my racing and my training and everything else between is I like to show people you can have fun doing triathlon and that you can have a balanced life doing triathlon you can do stuff like camping and um, bike packing and you can enjoy gardening on the weekend or roasting coffee and even drinking beer you know like I, I that's how I live my life it's very balanced and um, and that's also like we have to remember a lot of people are, are doing the sport for enjoyment and they might be struggling with like trying to find that balance um, because like endurance sports and triathlon specifically is very addictive by nature. Like you need to, you need to put in the hours. You can't do the sport without in some ways being addicted to it. And often often that comes with sort of like an unhealthy obsession to training and balance is forgotten. So yeah, that's definitely my thing is to show that like you can perform and enjoy the sport and, you know, still have, um, a network of friends and and people um, that you can spend time with, and you don't have to, yeah, hibernate and train all day and live unhappy. So. Josh, I think your attitude is a valuable counterpoint to the way triash, triathlon is pushing at the moment, and I think it's a breath of fresh air that will hopefully inspire a new generation of athletes to think there's many different ways to become a pro triathlete and many different type of lifestyles that can take you to the top. Thank you very much for taking the time to chat with me. Thanks, Anthony. It's been great. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to today's interview. If you like this interview, I'm going to put another interview up here, which I know you're really going to enjoy. And please click on that subscribe button. Talk to you soon.